Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. learners welcome to the session of managerial economics i am dr supriya jain working as an assistant professor in the institute of business management at gla university mathra so let's begin with our today's session and before we talk about our today's discussion let us have a look at the topics which we have covered in our previous session we have talked about production as because production is a very important activity of any organization how the production of goods and services takes place it is basically an activity where we transform the inputs into the output so that people can have some uh, you know they will be able to satisfy their needs and wants with the production of those goods and services the things which can create utility for them are being converted to the process of production and for the production we requires factor inputs like land labor capital entrepreneur all these are the factors of productions which are used for the production purpose thereafter in that uh, session we have also talked about production function and production function is basically based on the factors of production what factors are we using and if we talk about production function with one variable and production function in uh, with two variable that basically depends upon the uh, you know size right whether we are doing production in a short run or we are planning for the production in the long run as we have seen that we have two type of cost we have fixed cost as well as variable cost so in short run there are two type of inputs we, uh, some of the inputs are of fixed nature which cannot be changed because uh, there is not enough time for those inputs to, uh, to be changed and some of the inputs are the variable input so in short run we understand the production function with the law of variable proportion and in this law of variable proportion we have seen that when we keep one uh, input as a fixed input like if this capital is been kept as a fixed input there is no change we are making into the capital and in the variable input like labor we are increasing the size of labor to increase the size of the output right so what happen initially when we increase uh, the labor the return which we are going to get in our output that would be an increasing return right a lesser change in the labor we are getting more change in the output but when we keep on doing the same thing the later next stage which we are going to get here the returns which we are going to get will be called as diminishing return right returns we are getting but at diminishing rate but if we continue keep on increasing the size of labor and keeping our capital to be fixed then you will see that later on uh, the organization will not get any return but that that to their return will go into the negative right so it is not advisable for the firms to continuously increase only the one variable input and keeping the fixed inputs to be fixed because of that their ratios change significantly right so this is one thing which we have seen with the law of variable proportion right we should make our production up to the point where we are getting returns even if the diminishing returns are been uh, getting by the firm then also it is fine right then we have talked about production function with two variable and this we have studied with the help of law of return to scale now this law of return to scale here we have seen that how we can change both the inputs because this we are talking in the long run and in long run no input is a fixed input right all the inputs are the variable inputs so we can easily change the size of capital as well as the labor to increase the size of output but in this law of return to scale we have seen that when initially we increases both the labor and the output the return which we were getting were called as you know increasing return right a lesser change in the input brings the you know more change in the output whereas in the second stage we call it as an uh, you know constant return the return which we are going to get would be called as constant return uh, as much as change we are making in our input the same change we are getting in our output whereas in the later stages we will get the diminishing return where we are putting more input and we are getting less of output right so return will be there in all these stages but definitely it will go down 
initially you will get increasing return then your return will become constant and then you will get it at a diminishing rate right so this is what law of return to scale explained to us thereafter we have talked about iso quants right iso quant like i said iso means equal and quant means quantity so here with this iso quant we have seen how we can use the combination of the given inputs so as we would be able to produce the given output like here if we define iso quants like quantity is fixed and how we are using uh, the combination of capital as well as labor to produce the given level of output right so iso quant we have uh, talked about this iso quant in detail we have looked at the properties of iso quant that iso quant curve will always be downward sloping representing the two uh, you know inputs are the substitute of each other if you are increasing the size of capital then we have to reduce the size of the labor right that is why this curve is downward sloping and it always be convex to the origin right we have also seen that higher iso quant will uh, gives the higher output because in this case both the inputs will be increased either the capital is increasing or labor is increasing or maybe the both of them are increasing and we have also understood that uh, they will never intersect with each other because we are considering to be uh, these inputs as in substitutes we are not uh, you know we are indifferent between the use of the these two inputs and that is why these iso quant curve will never intersect thereafter we have talked about iso quant line and this iso quant line tells us the budget of a producer like for a consumer to buy any commodity there is a budget a given income and with that limited income a person has to get a maximum satisfaction of the commodities which they are consuming in the same way the producers also have a given budget within that budget they have to make their production with the combinations of given input right and lastly we have talked about the equilibrium point how a producer is going to reach to the equilibrium point and the equilibrium point would be the point where uh, the line of iso cost curve and the uh, you know iso cost line will be equal right so uh, at the point see the point where iso cost line and iso cost curve are meeting each other because that is the point where a producer is utilizing these inputs to the you know optimum utilization they are making and the production which they are going to get where we will be getting the highest marginal productivity right so these are the topics which we have talked about in our previous session now let us look at the uh, you know uh, learnings which you are going to get from this session so here we have these learning objective of our today's session and we are going to understand here about different market structure what is meant by market and how different markets are there right so it will introduce you to the basic of market morphology the structure the form of the market and you will be able to identify the different market structures by understanding their features right secondly you are able to examine the nature of the perfectly competitive market this is one of the form of the market which we are going to study here in detail and you will find out and figure out the features of perfect competitive market then you will also able to examine the nature and the different forms of uh, monopoly market thereafter we will understand the nature of imperfect competition or the monopolistic competition because this is the form of imperfect competitive market and the another name we call it as a monopolistic competitive market this is basically the combination of previous two market where we have talked about perfect competition as well as monopoly and lastly you'll be able to examine the nature of oligopoly market so this is what you are going to learn from our session today let us start with the market what is meant by market so market is a term which you have heard many a times and it refers to a interaction basically it refers to the interaction between the buyer and the seller where sellers are selling their commodities and buying their uh, buyers are buying their commodity at a given price so that particular uh, you know reference where the buyers and sellers are interacting with each other that is considered to be a market right another definition can be market refers to all such systems or arrangements that will help the buyers and seller to come in contact with each other so that they can settle the sale and purchase of a good right where they are doing their bargainings at what price buyer is ready to purchase and at what price seller is ready to sell and when they come to a point the selling and buying takes place the exchange of goods and services takes place between the buyer and seller and that situation we refers to as an market right 
So, for market there are few things to be there, one there should be a seller, there should be a buyer, there should be a product, there should be a price and earlier we also used to say that there should be a place, but now a time we are not referring or specific to the place because we are buying things without uh, meeting each other physically or to be present at a specific place because in today's time we are having this online platforms of buying and selling commodities, right. So, market is particularly uh, interaction between the buyer and seller where goods and services are being exchanged with a price, give the given price, right. So, let us start to understand this market morphology, right. Market morphology means the structure, the forms of market and we have different forms of market which are basically being categorized on certain aspects, right. Like first is the nature of competition. We are categorizing the market on the basis of competition. In different market, different level of competitions are there. In some of the market, there are large number of sellers. There are few market structure where we have very few sellers. And there is also a market structure where we have a single seller. That means there is no competition, right. So, we are going to study about these different markets based on their competition that is being called as nature of competition will help you to understand the different form of market, right, where we have more sellers and where we have few sellers. The second can be done on the basis of product, right. Now, here we have different sort of products available in the market, right. Some of the firms are producing homogeneous products. Homogeneous products are the products which are same or similar to each other. Some of the uh, markets are providing differential products. The products may be the close substitute of each other, but they are different from each other, right. So, based on the type of product or uh, commodity you are selling to the people in the market, that is also helping you to understand the different forms. The third is number and size of buyer. Yes, again like the size of sellers and the number of sellers defines the competition. We also understood that there can be different number of buyers in the market, right. Monopsony is one such situation where there is a single buyer, right. And, and you know, uh, there are different sellers to this particular buyer. So, whatever the buyer is, uh, you know, buying, uh, they are buying on their own terms and condition because they are the only buyer in the market. So, there are market where we have very uh, large number of buyers, where we have, uh, you know, few buyers or where we have only single buyer. So, that is also one way we are defining and, uh, you know, dividing our market on this basis. And lastly, we are saying freedom to enter and exit from the market. So, here we have different sort of structures where in some of the market structure there is a freedom of entry and exit. That means, if you want to enter into this area, if you want to start your production into this particular form of market, in some market there is a freedom, there is no restriction as in when you want to enter into this market and you want to start up with your business, uh, right, into that particular form, you are freely, uh, free to enter into it or to exit from it any time if you are not working well, if you are not, uh, if you do not want to continue uh, with your business, then you can easily exit from it as well, right. But there are certain market structure where the entry is restricted, right. Uh, you cannot easily enter to that market. So, there are different sort of restrictions which are there, which uh, we are going to study with that different market type, right. So, this is the market morphology based on which we are trying to understand the different forms of market based on the competition and competition is being defined by the number of sellers in the market, then the nature of product, whether the products are being supplied, uh, whatever the products are being supplied by the sellers are of homogeneous nature, right, or they are heterogeneous from each other, then how many number of buyers do we have in that market, right, the size of buyer is very large or we have only few or a single buyer or uh, whether the market has a free entry or exit, right. So, let us start with the very first type where we are going to talk about perfect competitive market. This perfect competition, this name is also, uh, you know, helping you to understand what is this market means with. The competition here which we are defining is a perfect competition and this is the, uh, you know, uh, you can say the most basic and the idealistic form of market and that is why this is how we are naming it. We are calling it as an perfect competitive market. 
but you can also say that this particular form of market is uh, theoretical as well as hypothetical right so if you talk about the characteristics and the feature of this perfect competitive market very rarely we find this sort of market available though we have few features which you can see and find in some of the market uh, like, like we have this in, in the share market right but if you talk about the exact composition of all the features to be there in the market for this perfect competition that is very rarely we are seeing. So, this is the most basic and the ideal form of market, but definitely this form of market is a theoretical and hypothetical form, right. So, now let us start with the features of perfect competition. How are we going to characterize this market? What are the different features do we have? In this market, let us start with the very first point where we are saying we have presence of large number of buyers as well as seller. So, in a perfect competitive market, there are large number of buyers and the large number of sellers. So, first two points which we have discussed in the market morphology, you can say that based on the competition and the number of buyers do we have. So, that they both are very large, right? Suppliers are in large number as well as buyers are in large number. Second point talks about homogeneous product and the products which are being produced by the seller are of homogeneous nature that means they are same and identical right they are similar to each other. So, here the buyers who are buying the products from different sellers there is no difference among those products they are same they are uh, similar to each other right. So, this is a very important feature of this market which we need to understand that the products which are being sold under this perfect competitive market are of homogeneous nature. The third point talks about freedom of entry and exit. So, see in this market because this is the market where the products are homogeneous and we have large number of sellers and buyer because of this uh, particular feature only because in this market there is a freedom of enter and exit right. So, this is an unrestricted market any seller wants to come and join this market they can easily come and enter into this market and as in when they want they can easily leave, leave this market and in our further classes uh, when we will talk about the price and output determination under perfect competition this particular point will have a lot of reference in short run as well as in the long run right under perfect competition the firms which are working in the short run they can earn super normal profit, normal profit or they might can incur a loss right because of the competition we are having in the market right because of the uh, you know uh, this, this particular feature because in this perfect competitive market the firms are price taker and how do are going to take the prices that is basically determined by the demand and supply curve right and whereas uh, under the perfect competitive market the firms working in the long run will only earn normal profit because of this freedom of entry and exit the firms who are making the loss in the short run will exit from the market because it will be difficult for them to uh, survive in the long run and the firms which are earning super normal profit. Super normal profit is the profit where your average revenue is greater than average cost right. So, in this case the uh, other suppliers will get attracted right when, when some firms earn super normal profit in the short run they attract the new sellers to the market and when more people will be there into the market their cost of production will be higher which will ultimately reduce their profit margin and every firm will earn only normal profit. So, this we are going to discuss again in our uh, lecture where we will talk about price and output determination under perfect competition. So, for now to you to understand this freedom of entry and exit says that any new seller can enter into this market and any existing seller can exit from this market. Then there is a perfect knowledge. This is very important to understand because here in this market the buyers are having perfect knowledge of the market. They know each and everything regarding the quality, regarding the price, uh, everything of the product, right? No seller can make a buyer fool, right? Nobody can say that, that their product is better than the other or can charge higher prices from them, right? So, consumer have a complete knowledge of this uh, market. They, they are aware of prices, they are aware of the quality of the commodity. So, no buyer, no seller can cheat them or they can charge the prices as in what they want to, right? Then we have perfectly elastic demand curve, right? Perfectly elastic, if you remember guys, we have talked about this, uh, you know, under the price elasticity. 
we have different type of elasticities where we have perfectly elastic demand curve, where we, we have perfectly inelastic demand curve, the elasticity is relatively elastic or relatively inelastic or there is a unitary elasticity, right. So, where what we are talking here is under perfect competition, the demand curve of this perfect competitive market is perfectly elastic and how do we represent it? We represent it with the horizontal line, right. So, this is basically uh, the horizontal line which says that on y axis we have price and on the y axis we have quantity, right. So, here we are saying that even if there is no change in the price that causes lot of change in the quantity, right. So, here the demand curve will be perfectly elastic where the average revenue of the firm will be equal to the marginal revenue. Here there is a perfect mobility of factors of production. Factors of production we all know are used for the production of goods and services, right. So, what are we trying to say here is perfect mobility means the factors of production are perfectly mobile from one seller to the another seller because the commodities which they are selling are of homogeneous nature, they are same, they are similar, they are identical to each other, right. So, there is a perfect mobility, the same set of skills are being required by one seller are, are, are the same which are being required by the other seller. So, the factors of productions are perfectly mobile, they can move from one seller to the another seller very easily, right, that is what it means. And then we are saying there is no government intervention, yes, this is again very true under this perfect competitive market, government intervention is not there, government is not restricted this market in terms of anything because this market is basically being governed by the market forces, they are demand and supply. So, demand and supply are the two forces which regulate this perfect competition uh, market and that is why the firms who are working under perfect competitive market, they are the price taker, right, they are not the price maker, the sellers are not deciding the prices themselves for their product, they are taking the prices from the market and these prices are taken up based on demand and supply. Suppose if we, uh, we all know about the demand and supply curve or uh, this is your demand curve which represent that there is an inverse relationship between the price and the quantity, whereas this is the supply curve which represents then whenever there will be a higher price supply will be more. So, this will be the price which is going to be determined, OP will be the price for selling this OQ output under this perfect competitive market and if there is any change going to take place, suppose if the demand increases, so demand curve will shift towards right and supply remains the same. So, when demand increases, supply remains the same, the price of the commodity will go up. Vice versa, if the demand decreases, keeping the supply same, the price of the commodity goes down. Oh, okay, so with the interaction of this demand and supply, we determine the prices, so no seller under this market is, uh, you know, keeping the prices of their commodity, rather they take the prices from the market and accordingly they sell it. So, these are the features of perfect competitive market, where we are saying the number of sellers are large as well as the buyers are very large, the products which they are supplying are of homogeneous nature, in this market there is a freedom of entry as well as exit, consumers are having complete knowledge of the market, right. The, the demand curve under this perfect competitive market is perfectly elastic and there is a perfect mobility of factors of production because same set of skills are being required in different firms uh, because they are producing the similar nature of commodity. There is no government intervention and the firms are the price taker, right. Moving ahead, let us move to the next market structure where we have monopoly, right. What is meant by this monopoly market? And how are we going to understand? See, you can see here there are two words we are using, mono and poly. This also been written here, they are taken from Greek. Mono means single and poly means the buyer, right. So, this is how we call it. There, there is a single buyer, single seller in the market, right. Uh, polo means a seller and mono means a single. So, person who is a single seller in the market, that market would be called as monopoly market. So, monopoly market is a market where there is a single seller of a product which has no substitute, right. The product which does not have any substitute, that market uh, is being called as monopoly market. And if we look at the feature of this monopoly market, how are we going to understand what are the features of this market? So, very first feature is already been clear to every one of you that there is a single seller, right. He is the only seller in the market, there is no competition in the market. The product which is being sold by the person is the only one, 
right single product he is selling because there is no gross substitute of this commodity so there is a single seller and a single product which he or she is selling then there is no difference between the firm and industry yes again you can say that because the person is the single seller in the market there is no new firm and industry is what industry is basically the group of firm dealing in a same product line so when we are saying that there is a single firm in the market you either call it as a firm or you can call it as an industry right then there is a price maker yes definitely because uh, this uh, monopolist is a single seller in the market so whatever the price he keeps for his commodity he determine himself right he determine his own pricing strategy for the commodity depending upon the price elasticity of the commodity right if the product is of elastic nature then definitely uh, you know a monopolist has to keep their prices low to increase their profit margin and if the product is of inelastic nature then definitely uh, the monopolist can charge higher prices right he is the independent decision maker he decide where to stop and up to what production he has to make right we have talked about this optimum point in in the short run and the long run cost curve at which point we should be producing so that our cost of production is minimum but monopolis is not concerned with all these things because he is the single seller he has the capacity to determine the prices of his own so he independently decide himself up to which level he want to produce uh, so that uh, he can decide like what Uh, how he is going to generate his profit right how uh, much production he should do uh, depending upon the demand of the commodity right and accordingly he can charge the prices then we are saying that in this market there is an restrictive entry and because of this feature only we are able to understand this market clearly and that is why we have single seller right because this market is restrictive market nobody can easily enter to it right so there are different ways to get the uh, you know to get this monopoly right so the, the restriction needs to be understand what kind of restrictions are there why people are not able to easily enter into this market and whosoever has entered into that market is having that monopoly power and lastly we are saying there is a price discrimination yes this is one of the uh, you know very important feature which need to be understood in detail what is price discrimination price discrimination you can say is an art of selling same commodity to different people at different prices so this is what a monopolist can do because he is the single seller in the market and finding out the different elasticities in the different market depending upon the paying capacity of people in the different market he can charge different prices for the same commodity so looking at the feature of monopoly market we have understood what kind of market it is now let us discuss the different type of monopolies right monopoly can be of different type and it can be gained through different reasons right so what are those reasons uh, how people are having this monopoly power so very first point says about legal monopoly right monopoly can be gained through legal uh, authorities by getting some you know restrictions from the uh, government restricted that area right government does not allow any individual to enter into that area so that particular area will be restricted area and this restriction arises out of this legal uh, conditions right so it is created when the government restrict the entry of the other players into a particular market right it does not allow anybody to enter into this market so that particular market uh, monopoly would be considered to be as an legal monopoly right in order they want to keep the controls in their hand and that usually happens in the public utility services right where the demand is of inelastic nature so government knows because government uh, these public utility services government wants to keep them with themselves because they know if the private individuals will enter into this area they will charge higher prices because of inelastic demand and that will uh, you know exploit the customer so to uh, reduce that exploitation or to stop that exploitation government usually keep these public utility services which are of an elastic nature with themselves and does not allow anybody to enter into this area so it gives them the legal monopoly then monopoly can also be gained through economic right economic reasons this we have already understood what is meant by economies of scale right if there are some 
firms in the organization who are able to uh, you know work very efficiently right uh, the the cost of productions which they are making are very efficient so nobody else is able to enter into that market because the firm who is already selling into that market is selling at a very lesser price that nobody can enter into it and can beat out that price so economic monopoly is created when competition is eliminated right there is there, this uh, competition is actually been eliminated due to economic inefficiency of the other people right or, or the other players are not very uh, much playing their game uh, efficiently or they are not able to produce that economic efficiency and if the other firm is able to produce right uh, this this happens to uh, this happens because of two things either the others are very inefficient or it is because of the superior efficiency of a particular player if a particular player in that particular industry is able to produce that kind of economic efficiency that means that person can gain this economic monopoly because of the insufficient economy they are providing the other players are not that much efficient economically right so that is what is called as economic monopoly then we can also have natural monopoly yes because of natural reason there are certain goods which found in that specific area right and because of that those areas are having that natural uh, monopoly even the wto right they, they say that because of the intellectual property right they have gained because of some of the commodities are been produced into that uh, specific area right that is basically is called as natural and regional monopoly okay so natural monopoly arises when the market size is very small right when the size of a market is small so that it can accommodate only one uh, player in the market right sometimes the people also relate this natural monopoly to the economic monopoly because that particular player is uh, you know uh, playing the game so efficiently economic efficiency is so much there that the other persons are not able to enter into this market so naturally they get that monopoly power and last was your regional monopoly like i was saying right because of some uh, regions right because of that particular good and services are available in th uh, those reasons only and because of that people can have this regional monopoly uh, power as well right so some geographical and theoretical aspects help in creation of monopoly like for example specific uh, herb plant or seeds which are covered into that area right and if the people of those regions have taken the intellectual property right ipr right in short we can call them of those herbs plants and seeds so they will have their monopoly into that area right so these are the different uh, types of monopolies which can be there but monopoly is a market which we need to understand that here in this market there is a single seller he is the price maker he determines uh, or uh, you know he he has independence of taking his own decision and the product does not have a close substitute in the market right now looking at the uh, important feature of this monopoly market where we have talked about price discrimination and like i said price discrimination is one of the important characteristic of this monopoly market where he he can charge different prices from different people for the same commodity right now looking at the prerequisites of the price discrimination before a monopolist can uh, you know go with the price discrimination what are the prerequisites uh, like the first one is market control definitely a person who is not able to control the market cannot go with this price discrimination as being a single seller into this market he has a full control over the quantity as well as on the price and that is why he is able to control the market and can have a discrimination among the prices right so first of all that person can only go with the price discrimination who has a market control and monopolist can do it very well because of being single in this market then second is division of market yes this is again important before you go ahead with the price discrimination you should be able to divide your market into different uh, forms right where the different elasticities will be there like the third point is talking about different elasticity like absence of arbitration right different uh, ma different of market should be there then only the price discrimination is possible otherwise it will be difficult for a monopolist to uh, charge different prices from the consumers right so first is market control he should have a market control secondly he should be capable of dividing his market into two or more markets 
and each and every of these market should have different elasticities so that he can charge different prices based on the elasticities of the market. Suppose if the market is of inelastic nature, then monopolist can definitely charge higher prices to those people because uh, in that particular market, there will be a lesser change in the quantity even if the prices go up, right? Whereas the market which are of elastic nature, then definitely monopolist should charge lesser price because here demand will get more affected with the change in the price, right? Now we have the basis for price discrimination. How on, uh, on what basis are we discriminating among the prices? The very first point is the personal, right? It can be done on the personal basis. If you know the person, right? If you have some personal kind of interaction with that person where you know the need and the paying capacity of the person, then you can definitely charge accordingly, right? So personal basis based on the personal interaction with the consumer and that uh, personal interactions give you the idea about the need, desire and the paying capacity of the person and accordingly you can charge different prices. Second is based on geography, yes different places, uh, are, uh, different prices are being charged based on different uh, geography right or different places uh, in, in the particular region. Okay, so in some of the region, maybe you can divide that geography based on the rural area or the urban area, right? So different sort of prices are being charged depending upon that particular region, that particular, uh, you know, area, uh, how people are going to be charged. Somewhere we are charging higher prices, somewhere we can also charge the lower prices. Discrimination can also be based on demographic reasons, right? Demographic reasons like maybe because of the age of the people, like you can uh, say for railways, right? People who are children who are of, uh, you know, uh, lesser age or people who are old age, uh, above uh, the 60, right? Or people who are physically having some problem, right? Physically handicapped people. So for these people, railway charges lesser prices, right? So based on the dis uh, demographics, uh, you can also charge different prices from different people. The fare of, uh, you know, ticket will be different for these the people children's below age or people older age or physically uh, disabled people, right? Then it can also be done on the basis of time. Uh, this the, the price discrimination can be done on the basis of time because you can see that different things are being defended depend on the time period. Suppose uh, the demand for winter product go or, or, or the demand for wind, woolen clothes goes up in winter, but when you are uh, buying those clothes in the summer, then definitely the prices will be less, right? So depending upon the time frame, depending upon the season of that commodity, you can also change the prices, right? If at that particular uh, time period, if the product has been demanded more because of that particular season, right? Then you can definitely charge higher prices as compared to the off season. Then paying capacity is again one of the most important consideration. You can take example of doctors, that doctors can charge different prices uh, for the consultation provided to them depending upon the paying capacity of their customers, right? If they are capable of paying more, they can definitely charge higher consultancy uh, for, their, the, for, for their services they are providing, right? And so on. Then depends upon the purpose of use, right? Its purpose of use is also important for what purpose you are using it. Like for electricity charges, right? Electricity charges are different for the domestic use and they are different for the industrial use, right? So what purpose you are using it? Like loan lids, okay? We avail loan facilities from the uh, financial institutions, but the rate of loans differ from uh, different purpose, right? If you are availing a uh, personal loan, then you need to pay more in rate of interest. If you are buying house and you are taking housing loan, then definitely your rate of interest will be lesser. So for what purpose you are availing that loan will also discriminate among the prices, right? And also depends on the need for what purpose you are uh, needing it. Like for example, lawyer, right? Uh, a person who is fighting for the case uh, for their death, right? Uh, for their survival of life and death, then in that case, the lawyer might charge the higher price. But if it for a general case only some sort of, you know, uh, uh, some sort of normal problem is there for which you have hired the lawyer, then definitely the lawyer can charge a lesser price, right? So for what purpose, what is the need of that particular thing? Accordingly, the different prices can be charged. 
So, price discrimination is again a very important consideration and uh, it has to be understood very clearly because it can be used by the monopolist being a single seller in the market and having a full control on the market. He can charge different prices from different people based on these consideration, right. Moving ahead, we have monopolistic competitive market. Monopolistic competitive market, you can understand this market with the combinations of previous two markets which we have studied that was perfect competition and monopoly, right. As we have seen in the perfect competitive market, there are large number of buyers and sellers and the product which they are selling are of homogeneous nature. Whereas in monopolistic competitive market, you can see that again there is a large number of buyers and sellers. The number of buyers and sellers are very large, but the products which they are selling here are not homogeneous, they are heterogeneous, right? They are different from each other. And you can even say that the competition based on this monopolistic competitive market is based on the product, right? Not, not, not on the basis of price, right? So, it is a market situation in which relatively large number of products are being offered similar but not identical. They are similar, they are close substitute of each other but they are not identical. So, that is why we are characterizing them as an heterogeneous rather than to be called as homogeneous and that they are in the perfect competitive market we were having homogeneous product. And why we are adding this word mono to it? Because uh, this, this is a market because of the differentiation in the product, every firm has a sort of a monopoly, right? Every firm has their own set of loyal consumers or customers and that is why they are having a monopoly into that area by creating their name, by creating their demand and at the same time they are competing with the other firms because we have large number of substitutes available for this commodity. So, now let us look at the features of uh, monopolistic competitive market. Here we have large numbers of buyers and sellers that we have already understood. The number of buyers and the sellers are very large in the monopolistic competitive market and the products which they are selling are of heterogeneous nature, right? They are different from each other, okay? You can also call it as a price differentiation, sorry, product differentiation and product differentiation can be uh, of different type also. Sometimes there is an imaginary differentiation uh, that, that, that actually means that there is no, no difference between the product of A as well as the product of B company or B firm. But there is an imaginary differentiation because we usually think that A company has a better brand than B. So, people prefer to buy the product of A, right? So, it depends upon how you have created your name in the market or your, uh, you know, brand in the market, right? It can be based on the after sale services you are providing, the differentiation also based on the physical, uh, you know, look of that particular good. So, there can be different aspects which can be used to discriminate your product, right? Then the selling cost, yes, selling cost also plays a very important role in this market because we have close substitutes available uh, in the market and these firms working under the monopolistic competitive market, they spend lot of money on advertising, right, to, to create the demand for their product, to tell the people about the differentiation of their product, right? So, they, they spend a lot of money on the advertisement of the product and as we all know, no producers pays the cost of advertisement from their pocket, they ultimately charge it from the customers by adding it to the price of the product, right? So, selling cost again plays a very important role in this market because ultimately whatever is, the expenditure is being made on the advertisement that passes on to the selling cost of that commodity. Then independent decision maker, yes, for sure. Uh, Monopolis is an independent decision maker, he can determine his own prices, he is the price maker and he can determine the size of output he want to produce for his commodity, right? Then there is an imperfect knowledge, yes, this, this you can compare with the perfect competitive feature, there we were having perfect knowledge of the market and no seller can cheat the uh, buyer by saying that their product is better than the other. So, they were aware of the quant quality as well as the price in the market, availing price in the market, but here in this monopolistic competitive market, uh, there is an inco incomplete information, right? Imperfect knowledge is there with the customer, where customers are not aware with the exact quality of the commodity and any, any seller can claim that their product is better than the other and because of that, they are charging the higher prices, right? Then lastly, we have this unrestricted entry and en uh, exit for this firm. Again, in this market, there is an unrestrictive entry and exit. Any new firm can enter and any existing firm can exit from this market structure, right? So, we have seen that perfect competition is also having the same feature 
where we were having unrestrictive entry and exit right whereas in monopoly there was an restrictive entry right because of that there was a single seller so these are the feature of monopolistic competitive market where we have large number of buyers and seller to keep into consideration and the products which they are selling are of heterogeneous nature they are different from each other and because of that the selling cost is will be higher as the seller in this market are spending lot on advertisement they are making their independent decisions regarding the price regarding the output they want to produce here the consumers are having in in imperfect knowledge of this market and lastly we have seen that this market gives unrestricted entry and exit for the sellers right now let us move to the next type of market where we are going to talk about oligopoly right this is the another form of market and here we have few sellers and few buyers okay so oligopoly market is that market which is also interdependent on each other so you can see we are here we have few dominant seller and they sell differentiated and homogeneous products so here you can see with this particular market we have few sellers and the products which they are selling they can be of different shaded nature also heterogeneous products can be there or homogeneous products product can be there right so that depends upon what kind of commodity they are uh, selling that creates and differentiated oligopoly or pure monopoly so differentiated oligopoly is a uh, structure or you can say a market form where there are few number of sellers interrelated to each other but the products which they are selling are of differentiated nature like you can take an example of uh, automobile industry cars right they have their own features they have their own prices so here they comes into the oligopoly market but the products which they are selling are differentiated from each other whereas if you talk about the pure monopoly here the products are identical to each other the products which they are selling are same like steel industry right like petroleum industry the petrol which they are selling are of same nature okay so these are the this is how we define this oligopoly market for us to understand it clearly what we say oligopoly is a market form where we have few dominant seller this word is again playing a very important role to make you understand these sellers are very dominant and a prominent uh, in the market right and the products can be homogeneous or products can be heterogeneous if the products are of uh, homogeneous nature that will create a pure monopoly whereas if the products are of differentiated nature then we call it as an differentiated oligopoly now let us have a look on the features of this oligopoly market where we are saying here we have few sellers that we have already understood products can be of two type homogeneous or heterogeneous and then we can see that there is are there are entry barriers though this is not a restrictive market firms can enter into this market but definitely because of these reasons which we are going to talk right now they have the entry areas like, like like they create a barrier for the people to enter into this market though they can enter but because of huge requirements huge investment requirement the people working under this oligopoly market they they they, they need lot of capital investments okay they, this is not very easy for you to enter into this market because it requires a huge amount of capital investment so whosoever is capable of making that huge investment will be able to be a part of this oligopoly market and that is why we have few dominant uh, players in this market then strong consumer loyalty for the existing brand yes the brands which are available here in this market they have the huge consumer loyalty so if you are thinking of entering into this market right you need to be very much sure whether people will shift uh, their demands to your commodity or not because they are having their set of loyal people which are associated with the with the products of those companies right and they have also economies of scale because they are having a huge capital investment so they are working on the large scale and we have already understood working on the large scale how it provides you the economies right how you will be able to reduce your cost by having technical economies by having labor economies financial economies right you can also have managerial economies so all these economies will reduce your cost so if anybody else will enter into the market and will make this kind of huge investment and will not be able to generate the profit then there is no point of uh, getting into it so this actually provides a kind of a ban uh, entry barrier to the people to enter into this area and therefore therefore we have few sellers then there is an interdependence decision making yes the few sellers who are working in this oligopoly market there is an interdependence among them 
because you can see that uh, there are very few people and the products can be of homogeneous nature or if even if the products are of heterogeneous nature, the demand of one uh, particular firm will create an impact on the demand of the another firm because they are again a close substitute of each other, right. So, usually they, they form a uh, decision making where they take the interaction of other people also like if we are deciding something for an individual firm, what uh, will be the impact on the other firm because of our change we are making, right. So, we need to keep into our mind uh, whenever we are making any decision of our individual firm, how the other firms are going to react on it, right. Independent decision making you cannot make because of the interdependence of the firms in this market, right. There is no price competition, they are the price maker, but they are not actually competing on the basis of price, but yes, there is a sort of a price rigidity you can say which we have in this oligopoly market because in this market if an individual firm will increase their prices themselves. So, if they are reducing their prices, the other firms can also reduce their prices, right. And if you further uh, reduce the prices, then they can also reduce the price. So, there can be a sort of a price war which will neither benefiting you or the other firm, right. So, there is no price competition, but yes, because of the interdependence of firm in this market, there is a kind of a price rigidity. And lastly, we have the indetermined demand curve. Like in the previous cases, we have seen that perfect competitive market is a perfectly elastic demand, whereas in monopoly market, demand is of inelastic nature, uh, right? Whereas, sorry, it is of elastic nature, whereas in monopolistic competitive market, because we have some sort of loyal you know customer associated with all the firms. So, here the plus, uh, price elastic uh, sorry demand elasticity is elas inelastic in nature, whereas in case of oligopoly market we uh, cannot determine the demand curve, ok. It is very difficult because of the close substitute of each other, right. Now, let us look about what is meant by duopoly, right. We have talked about perfect competitive market monopoly, monopolistic competition and we have also discussed about oligopoly. This duopoly is also in another uh, form, uh, form of market which is which can be there under this oligopoly. Duo means two and poly means the seller, we already know that, right. So, this is the special case of oligopoly with only two players in the market. If there are two players uh, in the market, right, then we call it as a duopoly. When we have few sellers in the market, we call it as an oligopoly and when we have only one seller in the market, that market will be called as monopoly market, right. So, these are the different forms of market which we have studied, we have seen their features. Now, let us look ahead the market morphology which we have studied based on the sellers, based on the buyers, based on the entry and exit to the market, right. How are we going to understand these different market morphologies? Here we have weighed the difference on the basis of firms they are having in the market and the numbers of buyers to this firm and what can be the possible examples associated to this market. So, looking at the perfect competitive market, we are saying that here we have very large number of firms as well as very large number of buyers, both the sellers and buyers are large in number and usually we can keep these markets under this consideration, agriculture commodity, uh, agriculture commodities can be there, shares can be taken up as a share market can be taken up as an example of perfect competitive market or you can say the market for unskilled labor is also called uh, is also having the feature of perfect competitive market. Though we have understood that this perfect competitive market is more of theoretical and hypothetical in nature, right. But still these are some examples which we can use for this perfect competitive market. Moving ahead we have monopolistic competition. In monopolistic competition you can see we have many buyers as well as many sellers. Here the sellers and buyers are very large in number, but if you talk about monopolistic competition, they are also having many buyers and many sellers and usually we can take the example of retail stores of detergents and other commodities to be a part of this monopolistic competitive market. Then we have oligopoly market and oligopoly market is a market where we have few firms as well as few buyers, right, because the products which they are selling are also. Uh, you know of uh, dominant players in the market. So, we have few sellers and the few buyers also for the commodity and the example which you can take up for the oligopoly markets are your automobile sector providing cars, your computers, IT industry, petroleum industry, right. So, all these are your example of oligopoly market and as we have seen in this market there is an intermediate demand, indetermined demand curve 
because the products are again substitute of each other. So, you cannot determine the demand of your commodity in advance and usually there is an interdependence of decision making right. Then we have monopoly having a single seller, but we have many buyers for it. Here the seller is single, but the buyers will be many and we can take an example of Indian railway right, because Indian railway here in this we are not having anybody who is providing this kind of services to the people, but if you talk about the mode of transportation, then definitely we have other substitute available like people can travel through airways, people can uh, travel through roadways also. But yes, if you talk about uh, monopoly example, because nobody is providing this kind of railway services, then uh, this railway, Indian railway is an example of monopoly, right. Then we have duopoly, duopoly where we have two farms, right, but buyers are again many uh, and we can take an example of Pepsi and Coke, right, Pepsi and Coke. Uh, can be used as an example of duopoly market situation where these two companies are having a prominent role in the market. These are the two sellers in the market and the because they have created this kind of uh, you know duopoly situation by having this uh, you know you can call it as an uh, acquisition or mergers. Now, these becomes the two important player in the market where they are supplying the commodities to many people. And again like we have seen in the monopolistic competitive market advertisement plays a very important role. Same is the case of the oligopoly market, here also the seller spends lot of amount on the advertisements of their commodity. And lastly we have one more consideration written over here and this market is called as monopsony, right. So, do not get confused this is monopoly and this is monopsony, monopoly is a market structure where we have a single seller, whereas monopsony is a market structure where we have a single buyer right, poly is for the seller and Sony is for the buyer. So, if we have only a single buyer for that commodity and we have many firms who are supplying that commodity, then that situation or the firm of market would be called as monop Sony. And here we can take the example of Indian defense industry, Indian defense industry is the only example for monop Sony because they are the only buyer from the different firms who are supplying them the uh, you know uh, requirements of the uh, defense industry, right. So, this is how we understand this market uh, morphology and now let us have a look on the uh, you know differentiation among all the different market structures which we have talked about that is perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly and monopoly. Now, let us look at the basis and have a clear understanding of difference among all the different market structure. So, first is based on the number of firms that we have already seen perfect competition has many sellers very large and there we have uh, several uh, sellers, oligopoly have few sellers and in monopoly we have only single seller. Then second is on the basis of freedom of entry, right. As we see that in the perfect competition there is a freedom of entry and exit, there is no restriction. Under this monopolistic competition also there is an open access, unrestrictive entry is there, new firm, uh, new seller can enter into the market. Whereas in oligopoly we have seen there is a controlled access, there is a kind of a barrier to entry. No, though there is not an unrestrictive entry, but yes there is a controlled access and that is usually because of the huge investments requirement, right, where nobody is capable of having that much of huge investments in the capital. Right, and because every set of existing brand have their own set of loyal customers associated to it. So, there is a kind of a control access under this oligopoly, whereas in monopoly we can say that there is a barrier of entry, right, there is a restriction to enter and that restriction can be based on technical reason, economic reasons or legal reasons that depends what kind of monopoly you are getting. Then if you look at the nature of commodity, we are selling in the different market. In perfect competition market, uh, competitive market the products are uniform, they are same, similar, homogeneous. Whereas in monopolistic competitive markets the products are of different consideration, right, differentiation is there. Then we have oligopoly market where the products are of uniform or differentiated nature and in the monopolistic competitive market the products are specialized, right, they do not have a close substitute of each other. If you look at the demand implication in perfect competition it is a perfectly elastic demand curve, whereas in monopolistic competition the demand curve is sloping downward keeping it as an elastic into consideration, whereas in oligopoly demand curve is of inelastic nature, right, there is a downward sloping demand curve 
and again in the monopoly demand curve is downward sloping which represents that there is a control over the price and is more elastic compared to the oligopoly right so this market is uh, having more inelastic demand average size of firms are here small in the uh, monopolistic competitive market also the size of firms are sub small but here in the oligopoly market the size of firms is comparatively very large as well as in the monopoly also the size of firm is large being a single seller into the market then if you talk about the possible demand uh, or consumer demand here price is unrelated to the quantity produced or sold right here the firms the have ability because they are the price taker they are the price maker and here in the oligopoly market there is no price competition and in talking about the monopoly demand will not remain constant as the firms can increase their output because they are the independent decision maker then if you talk about profit making possibility yes profit making possibility here is uh, you know you can not increase your profit uh, by increasing the price but definitely you can earn profit by reducing the cost because in the perfect competitive market prices are determined by the forces that is demand and supply here in the monopolistic competition makes no economic profit because of the competition in the market whereas in oligopoly they can earn good profit by making cartel and collusion cartel and collusion means they, are, they can make their own group right they can uh, take the advantage of monopoly and here because he is the single seller he can maximize his profit then as we know this in perfect competition there is no government interaction uh, intervention but here in the monopolistic competition there is a restriction of a government because they can block the entry by the government rules and regulation there is again also a restriction of government because these firms are not allowed to have collusion or to take a uh, you know power of monopoly with them and here also in the monopoly there are government interventions by the taxation price setting as well as nationalization and if you look at the criticism of these market uh, this is not seen in the reality this is not the ideal situation here lot of advertisements are been done right again the agreements made between the firm that depends upon the market based on the fixed quota and in monopoly being able to make economic profit in the short run as well as in long run they can use or increase their price inefficiently in their productivity and allocatively right so uh, all these things uh, all these markets have their own criticisms as well so by now i believe that you are clear with these different market structure so if you look at the topics of our review today we have talked about what market is and we have seen the different forms of market we have understood their features and we have also try to understand the difference among them where we have discussed about perfect competition monopoly monopolistic competition and oligopoly and these are the reference books which we have taken for the study of this lecture thank you all of you